let us now join in saying the call to God's word in unison. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? And in unison, our prayer for illumination. Lord, through your spirit, enable us to consider your word and to enact it in our lives to bring you glory and praise. Amen. I would ask you now to get your Bibles and to be able to see this reading from 1 Timothy where we left off last week and also other readings that will be from the book of Acts and also 1 Corinthians. But we begin first with the reading from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through chapter 2, verse 7. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you might fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, have, which some have rejected and so have suf suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness this is good and pleases god our savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth for there is one god and one mediator between god and mankind the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle, and am telling the truth. I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentile. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if you'll keep your Bibles out, so that you'll be able to find Acts, the book of Acts, and beginning at verse, um, well, I'll, I'll point you to it when we get there. Let's go ahead and hear now what the word is that God has for us today, according to the scripture from 1 Timothy. So, Paul in today's passage gives thanks and urges that thanks be given by those in the church like us. Now, giving thanks is not primarily prayer. Giving thanks is worship. I'm very thankful that you gave me leave in these last two weeks. I took the opportunity to take virtual online training and also to go to prayer events. The first training was on worship. And from that, I bring back some important reminders 
for all of us where we may have gotten off track or maybe don't have a full understanding. So first of all, there is a clear distinction that's made between prayer and worship, between teaching and worship. So first the latter. The one who delivers the teaching and preaching, hopefully, is doing so in a state of worshiping, offering it up to the Lord. But those who hear preaching and teaching may also worship, but sometimes we're just merely listening. We're just receiving. We're not lifting up what we hear to give thanks to God. Now, worship is not something that is received. Like, God doesn't worship us. We worship God. Worship is given to God. Do you hear that distinction? Now, prayer. What of prayer? Prayer, on the other hand, is not a one-way thing like worship is, is up to God. Prayer is a two-way communication between God and us and us and God. But still, most of us need to learn how to grow in that listening side of prayer, even during teaching and preaching, but to be better receivers of what God speaks. Still, even when we're receiving, we should be worshiping. We should be lifting up to God. So different than teaching and preaching is worship. So I'm no longer going to begin worship. <laughs> it's funny how I say that. Our time where we meet on Sunday's work, um, morning saying, I used to say this, please enjoy the prelude. No, worship is not about our enjoyment. It isn't. It's about giving glory to God. It's not about whether we enjoy the music, whether we enjoy the sermon, or whether we enjoy the surroundings in which we are sitting or standing or walking. And furthermore, we don't go to worship. We, um, it's not about a Sunday morning service only. Worship is our acknowledging God, preferably at all times and in all places. Worship is a one-way action fully directed at God, not God directing it at us. It's one direction only. It's a condition of our heart being completely surrendered to God. It occurs, worship occurs when we fully focus on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, all these aforementioned points of worship are also given expectations with today's passage and sermon. Here's what is meant. So in today's passage, Paul begins by giving thanks to who? He's worshiping, so to God, to Jesus. And Jesus is the one who assigns him as an apostle where he is sent in his worship to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why he travels to preach, to show his worship of God. He also worships when he writes letters or sermons to the churches and even to pastors like Timothy. So take note, though, that the good news to Paul that he's giving thanks for is not because he's a, in a high apostolic position. The good news for which Paul gives thanks is about the character of God, that God is full of love and mercy, and that shows in God coming incarnate through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Paul says that Jesus, who is the foundation of the church, came into the world. In love, Jesus came to sinners, and Paul admits he's the worst. So now we're turning um, to we're going to be turning to Acts soon to see why it is that Paul confesses that he was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. The description is apt because our first hearing of Paul is when he's called Saul in scripture. And we're looking at Acts chapter 8, verse 1. This is at the time of when Stephen the deacon is stoned to death. And this is what it says, the very first part of chapter one. And Saul approved of their killing him. Wow. That's the first introduction of Paul in scripture. Saul approving the killing 
of a deacon in the church. And then if we go down two verses later, it gets even more. It's not just one person. Verse three in chapter eight of Acts. But Paul began, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. You see why Paul describes himself the way he does? And then his sin comes to a further peak if we turn to Acts chapter 9 and we look there at verses 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Here, Paul is practicing premeditated murder of Christians. Wow, no wonder he tells us that he calls himself the worst. So these verses from Acts 8 and 9, those two chapter, illustrates why Paul refers to him as the worst of all sinners. But then we come to the reason why Paul gives thanks, where love and mercy, which comes through a conviction of sin. So when we worship, Sometimes we do receive something in our worship. We receive conviction of sin. And that's a true gift of love that comes through Jesus. For Paul, this happens also in chapter 9, in a few verses later, in verses 3 through 6 of Acts. This is what it says. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So this is what has happened to Saul. He was breathing out murderous threats, killing Christians, and then... Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and convicted him of his sin, led him into Damascus so that he could hear someone speak to him on Jesus's behalf. And that man is a man named Ananias. And we learn of Ananias in verse 17. And it says, or, um, on verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So Saul, though he thought he was a true worshiper of God in what he was practicing, in the killing of Christians, he discovered through Jesus appearing to him that he was sinning. And he was convicted of his sin. And so first he accepts that conviction. And then he accepts Jesus as Lord. And he is baptized. And he receives his call to apostolic ministry. But in the letter that we're hearing today, in 1 Timothy, in verse 116, we see how Paul is constantly in humble gratitude and thanksgiving for the love and mercy and the forgiveness of Christ. It says in verse 16, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So this is an example for us. Paul is an example for us. And then Paul continues on. We're back at 1 Timothy. Paul continues on. 
in chapter two, verse one. Paul also urges, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, verse two, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So Paul tells us that we should not just worship, but we should also pray. We should give thanks, but we should also ask petitions and we should intercede. This is what we should do. And for those in authority, those in government, what an important word for us today as we prepare for the November election. Some of us may have sent away for absentee ballots or we're getting rid of this, ready for this election. This is an important word um, and why there were Per, um, occasions that occurred in Washington, D.C. last weekend. While I was on leave, I virtually attended two prayer walks in Washington, D.C. I went to the walk by the Graham Association. I know another person in the congregation that also went virtually on that prayer walk and also on a call to prayer by a group of Messianic Jewish people that were there. Unfortunately, the president and the vice president and maybe some other people who are part of the political arena showed up, whether on recordings or in person to be a part of those walks too. In, in verses three and four of chapter two, Paul explains in talking about government authorities that God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, where there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So Paul is saying to us, we should all pray for government authorities, for them to come to Christ or to come closer to Christ. That should be a part of our regular prayer. So we've heard of Paul say, thank you for your love and mercy that comes to me. And we should say the same thing. So that's part of our worship. Also praying, which is our act of two-way communication between God, praying for government authorities. Now, the third point of this particular passage is how fitting today that this passage that exhorts thanks comes to us on World Communion Sunday, a day when we share in the Lord's Supper with all believers in all places. So we're worshiping, but we're also receiving. We see signs of forgiveness and the Lord's Supper. Now, the Lord's Supper is sometimes called the Eucharist. In Greek, the word is evkaristo. It's a word that's used to say thank you. It's a word for giving thanks. So it is that at the time of the last Passover Supper, Jesus gave thanks for the bread and for the juice of the grapevine when he was in Jerusalem for his last Passover Supper. And we remember it each time we celebrate communion. We also remember it by giving his words that are recorded and later quoted by Paul in a, another letter, and a letter that he writes to the church of Corinth. This is another site that Paul visited on his second missionary journey with Silas and Timothy. And we're gonna hear the words of um, institution from that letter in a little bit. So if you want to open to 1 Corinthians, though, I want us to take note, though, which relates to today's sermon on giving thanks and praying and petition. Our, our means of worshiping, as we said, sometimes evokes in us a need for confession of sin. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, after Jesus, the words that Jesus gave that Paul recorded of the Last Supper, this is what Paul writes. He exhorts this, starting in verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. 
But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. I already confess to you that when I went off to this class and learning about worship, how I opened the worship service was leading you in a way that was not worshipful when I said, enjoy the prelude. The worship should fully be about God, not about us. And I am leading in that way need to confess that before the Lord and before you saying that's a wrong stance. And I accept the discipline and the conviction of sin as a grace of love and mercy for which Paul and all of us should be thankful, especially as we take the Thanksgiving meal of the Eucharist. So that is why today we didn't pause at the prayer confession at the beginning of the service. At this end of the sermon, we're going to pause for a longer time of silent confession, maybe examining where our states of worship have been wrong, where we've taken a critical uh, voice of worship. Oh, this didn't feed me, or it didn't feel right, or I didn't like that. That's not what worship is about, or it might be something else. So today we're going to pause and focus on worshiping Jesus but also in focusing on how Jesus might convict us of our sin and leading us in a prayer of silent confession, allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal places in us where our behaviors and attitudes might keep us separated, even just by a thin sheet like cellophane between God and us. We don't want to be separated at all. So there's going to be a short time of silence that will be followed by a longer time with an interlude of let us break bread together. There you can sit in silence and continue to reflect, or if you feel as though the Spirit's leading you to worship God by that interlude, you can do so. But for now, let us pause in a time of silent confession before the Lord.